All right, good morning, everyone. We'll get started. Today is Friday, March the 3rd, and this is our third Transit Commission meeting of the term. We acknowledge that Ottawa is located on unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation, whose culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. Ottawa is on the unceded traditional lands of the Algonquin Anishinaabe First Nation, and their presence have been taking care. Um, they've been taking care of this land. And I will ask uh, Eric, our committee coordinator, to do the roll call. Uh, Councillor Brackington, here. Councillor Carr, here. Councillor Hill, present. Councillor Leeper, present. Councillor Lowe, here. Councillor Menard, here. Councillor Tierney, present. Counc uh, Vice Chair Curry, here. Chair Gower, here. You have quorum, Chair. Thank you. Okay, are there any declarations of interest from committee members? Seeing none. Confirmation of minutes is the first thing on our agenda then. Uh, these are the minutes from meeting number two on February 9th, 2023. Are the minutes confirmed? Confirmed. Confirmed, thank you. So we have a uh, presentation today, the regular OC Transpo update for rail, bus, and paratranspo. We also have uh, Councillor Lowe's motion from last time. So we're going to go right in the order here and begin with our presentation from staff. We have Renee and the team from OC Transpo. Good morning. Bonjour. Bonjour, Chair. Bonjour, tout le monde. Uh, je profite uh, peut-être uh, en débutant pour... Uh, pour Hello, everyone. I must say that today, this is a month of uh, the Francophony. And I'm very proud to be part of this group. As usual, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. As I mentioned last month, I will provide an update at each Transit Commission meeting on new or important OC Transport initiatives. Maybe Eric, tu peux mettre la présentation, s'il te plaît? Next slide, please. As I noted last month, we have a communications campaign aimed at public servants and other office workers returning to the workplace. Justin Turner, our Director of Strategic Communication and External Relations, will provide an update on the campaign in later slides. Okay. Staff will continue to monitor ridership demand, evaluate new ridership trends, and make adjustments to service if necessary. I want to also mention that we are examining options to create fairs that would encourage hybrid workers to choose transit. This would require council approval. We will provide you with an update once a recommendation has been developed. To enhance the customer experience, we are continuing to bring free Wi-Fi connectivity from TELUS to stations across Otran Line 1. When Line 1 opened in September 2019, Wi-Fi launched at Lyon, Parliament, and Rideau stations. This January, PMC became the fourth station to get Wi-Fi. This feature means customers don't have to use their own data to catch up on emails, scroll through social media, or read the news. As we move forward this year, more stations will be added. We will communicate this information with customers through our website and social media accounts. Customer signage will also be added to the stations as they get Wi-Fi. Have you seen our new blog? I'm so pleased to provide you on our newest customer communication platform. On February 13th, we launched the Next Stop blog. As you know, we are working hard to rebuild trust with our customers, and we know that communication is key. Our new blog is your destination for OC Transfer stories, explainers and behind the scenes looks at our operations that you don't normally see or hear about. It will also include updates on how we're improving our service, a look inside our complex business, 
and stories about our incredible people. We have so many talented and hardworking employees at OC Transpo, and we want to highlight them more. I had the chance yesterday to participate in a meeting. So these are all my, the members and their supervisors. And once more, I was able to see what's the dynamic in that team. The next step blog, it's a great resource for our customers. We are also looking for future blog post, past suggestions. So feel free to submit your ideas by visiting the blog. Next Wednesday, March 8th, is International Women's Day. I want to take this opportunity to thank all the incredible women who helped make OC Transpo a success. We have women in critical roles all across our department, from operators to special constables, to transit planners and engineers, and IT and communications professionals, among many more. It makes me so proud to work for an organization that values women and encourages for them to take on roles in so many different disciplines. Saturday, March 18th is Transit Worker and Operator Appreciation Day. We look forward to this day here each year. It's an opportunity to celebrate our amazing transit employees who together working, work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to ensure our customers get where they need to go. We'll be doing some internal communications and social media posts to recognize everyone's contributions. And we also invite members of council and our customers to thank OC Transpo employees as well whether it's in person or on social media. Take transit that day to recognize their work. I can tell you how much it means to our staff when they receive a kudos message. I would now like to pass things over to Jason Turner for an update on our return to office transit communications campaign. Following Jocelyn, Pat Scrimger will provide you an overview of how we continue to improve our services by listening to our customers. Followed by our key performance indicators with the two associate directors. Next slide, please. Justin, over to you, thank you. Merci, René. As you're aware, late last year, the government, oh, if we could get the next French slide as well, please. Oh, Pat, sorry, <laughs> thank you. Uh, as, you're, as you're very well aware, late, late last year, the government of Canada announced a new hybrid work model for federal public servants. Uh, and many other employers are also expanding their hybrid work models. And so this is a great opportunity uh, for our local businesses, the vibrancy of our community, and of course, for public transit. It's a wonderful news for businesses in the area and also for public transit. Office, we launched a communications campaign targeting hybrid workers. We're pleased to be partnering with the STO on this initiative. The tagline is to your office and back any day of the week. Allez, retour au bureau, n'importe quel jour. Uh, the campaign objectives are to uh, primarily increase ridership, attract new and returning customers, educate new and returning customers about how to use the system and how to plan their commutes, and ultimately to build trust in OC Transpo. We want people to know that transit is a cost-effective, flexible, and convenient option to get to the office. And we have a number of fare products available to suit the needs of every customer, including those working hybrid. Transit is also a very practical, economical way to go to the office and allows you for flexibility. The campaign will slowly ramp up and is structured in three phases. Uh, the campaign began in January and uh, primarily with earned uh, media and some organic social media posts. Uh, phase two is going to, will start later this month and will run until May. It includes an advertising plan with digital radio and social media ads, as well as using city owned assets, uh, billboards, screens, and of course, bus shelters. Uh, we will also be doing targeted outreach so that OC Transpo staff can reach potential customers directly uh, to promote our services. We'll be taking advantage of the upcoming festival and events season 
as well as working with employers to be present, physically present uh, in offices across the city. Phase three will run from May to September and will be based on what we learn and an evaluation of phases one and two of the campaign. Uh, it will also include new opportunities, including expanded outreach to federal government uh, buildings across the city as well. We're very pleased to be working with our colleagues at STL and Gatineau to reach customers who are using a combination of both transit systems to travel to their destinations. And this is one of the first times that we've ever worked with STL on a, on a partnership of this type. So we're really pleased to be doing that as well. We are very happy to work with our STO colleagues in Gatineau. We will be able to promote the both systems. Uh, these are just some examples of the creative the team has produced so far in-house. And again, we will be measuring and monitoring the success of the, of the campaign as we go. I also want to draw your attention to a new web section we just launched on octransport.com. Uh, it was launched in February. It's a one-stop shop for new and returning customers traveling to the office. It has a travel planner option, which automatically generates trip plans, uh, specifically for major government of Canada workplace destinations. It also includes travel planning resources and quick links to important information, including fare options, our park and ride lots, STO service, and more. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. I'll now pass the floor to my colleague, Pat Scringer. Thanks, Jocelyn. I just wanted to say a few words about the ways that we are, Eric, can we have the next? Thanks. Um, just say a few words of the, the different ways, some of the different ways that we are taking input from our customers and using it to improve service. Uh, we have uh, a program of telephone surveys, which we've begun the first one of, and it's on right now to ask people a structured set of questions, both whether they are customers, whether they are uh, uh, future customers, and ask them structured questions about their priorities in transit and their, their satisfaction with the, the service we deliver. We're going to do this in a structured way over time so that we can track changes in people's needs or changes in people's satisfaction with the service that we provide. Uh, you've heard uh, Madame Amilcar talk previously about the route review, which we have begun uh, to look at all of the bus routes across the entire network, both uh, as uh, travel patterns may have changed uh, during or because of the pandemic. Uh, as well as the uh, changes that we'll have to make to knit the bus route network in with the O-Train extensions coming over the next few years. That project will include several uh, stages of, of consultation with customers, with you as counselors, with our colleagues who operate the buses and trains, and also with uh, stakeholders, major employers, and advocacy groups. Our paratransport customers we're in contact with regularly. One of the great things about uh, paratranspo services, almost every booking starts with a phone call with our staff and uh, any information can be can be relayed very quickly, but we also have an ongoing uh, working group meetings with, with uh, customers where we work through all aspects of continuous improvement for paratranspo service. Et nous accueillons uh, toujours uh, des commentaires et des... We are also receiving feedbacks and comments from our clients. Uh, we read it, we examine it, we consider it, and there's many, many ways for people to get in touch. Uh, and the easiest way is through octransport.com. The other thing I just wanted to mention very briefly, just uh, new news as of yesterday, is we've relaunched our busker program in cooperation with the city's, uh, as part of the city's uh, promotion and support for local musicians. Uh, that program was going on well before the pandemic started. And so we've resumed where we where we suspended our work about three years ago. Uh, musicians who had previously applied and been accepted to the, the program, we're contacting them now to see if they're still interested. And there's also an application process that's open. So very soon we hope to be seeing uh, local musicians performing in some of the O-Train stations in those designated spaces that we've had. So that's uh, that's very positive news. I'll now pass the uh, baton over to my colleague, Paul Trebutat. Thank you, Pat. Appreciate it. Uh, good morning, Chair and members of the Transit Commission. I'm Paul Trebutat, the Chief Safety Officer at OC Transpo. The slide in front of you shows three key performance indicators that we monitor at OC Transpo, and they are employee injuries, customer injury rate, and 
vehicle collision rate. Each of these KPIs show the annual result for at least the last three years, and at the far right is the result for the month of January. To give added context, the employee injuries are measured in absolute numbers of injuries, while the other two indicators are measured as rates. The customer injury rate is the number of injuries that required emergency medical service attention per 1 million customer trips. And the vehicle collision rate is the number of vehicle collisions per 100,000 kilometers traveled by OC Transpo in aggregate. In all cases for the month of January, these indicators are showing an increase. And although every one of these results are not meeting our safety management system targets, we will be doing a comparator study of other transit agencies' performance indicators later in the summer timeframe. Unfortunately, the data from the other transits will not be available for us to analyze before then. In the past six months, we've been working on a number of mitigations that include an emphasis on monthly safety observation campaigns aimed at improving compliance to specific areas of the Highway Traffic Act. Examples of this include campaigns on distracted driving, following distances, defensive driving, and so on. As well, we have conducted other initiatives such as employee refresher training. We've reviewed investigations, and in some cases where an opportunity to advance safety is believed to exist, we have conducted in-depth safety investigations into accidents. All of these efforts and others are aimed at bringing focus and attention to our safety management system's primary objective, and that is to reduce harm. Next slide, please. On the 1500 Saint Laurent campus and in the employee parking area behind 899 Belfast Road, we've installed three speed boards. These speed boards have been installed because of observed speeding on our property. And in spite of posted signs for the speed limit, we continued to see non-compliances that posed risks to our employees, contractors, and the public under a variety of weather and lighting conditions and frequent mixed traffic movements. The installation of the speed boards is an example of encouraging a proactive safety culture instead of waiting for an accident before doing something about the speeding concerns on the campus. Also, I'd like to point out to you that great care was taken during the photographing of the speed, board, the speed boards photos by posting a special constable vehicle with lights flashing and using a qualified bus instructor to operate the bus as well as using a spotter. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Merci, Paul. Uh, bonjour, Monsieur le Président et les conseillers. I'm Scott Laberge. Hello, everyone. I'm Scott Laberge. Transit Customer Systems and Planning, uh, working alongside uh, my colleague, Pat Scrimmager. Uh, dans le graphique uh, suivant, nous examinerons les indicateurs. As we see on the screen, we are going to look at the monthly performance of review for January 2023. 2023 performance indicators. Um, on this slide is our monthly snapshot overview of our performance measures for January. In upcoming slides, we'll review each metric in greater detail. As you can see for paratranspo, call center phone response time averaged a two minute and six second wait time to speak with our customer services team. On-time performance is at 95%. And ridership has returned to 76% of pre-pandemic levels. For a conventional bus and O-Train, O-Train line one and conventional bus are both at 97% service delivered. As you heard through the budget process in 2023, we are estimating an annual average 70% return to pre-pandemic ridership. The ridership estimate profile shows the year starting at 65% and ending at 75%. 
In January, ridership has returned to 62% of pre-pandemic levels and is in line with our estimates. Next slide, please. Uh, for Paratranspo on-time customer pickup performance, it was 95% in January. This is the percentage of customers picked up on time during their 30 minute pickup window. Even with increased paratranspo ridership and higher traffic volumes that we're seeing across the city, there was an improvement from the, pre from the previous month. Next slide. This chart shows the amount of time that someone needs to wait when calling to book a paratranspo trip. Down from December, 2022, Paratranspo's telephone booking line response times were the lowest they've been in the last year with an average wait time of two minutes and six seconds, sitting well below the council directed 15 minute threshold. Our investments in staff and technology in this area continue to improve the customer experience. Next slide. In January, 2023, Paratranspo saw 78,000 reservations through the customer center and online. 7% of the reservations uh, in January were made online with My Paratranspo. These are represented here as the orange, por orange portion of the bar chart. This marks a small increase in online bookings from December, 2022. We, we continue to encourage customers to use our online booking tool. Next slide. Up slightly from December, 2022, feedback from Paratranspo para customers averaged 1.7 complaints per 1,000 trips. We continue to see service delivery feedback. The dark blue portion holds steady, which is very good. In January, we experienced more calls than in the previous month regarding bookings and general information. This is the orange portion of the bar. As you can see, we've made significant improvements in this area. There is almost a two thirds reduction in complaints in, comp in comparison to the same period last year. In 2023, we continue to strive to improve the paratranspo customer experience. Next slide. On this chart, you see paratranspo ridership monthly totals in thousand customer trips. The red line represents 2019 pre-pandemic conditions. The gray line is the 2023 estimated budgetary paratranspo ridership profile. The gray colored bars are the 2022 monthly ridership data for comparison. The black bar on the left side of the graphic is the January 2023 paratranspo ridership at 57,000 trips which is in line with the budgetary ridership profile. Ridership is almost double the same time period last year and just 18,000 trips less than pre-pandemic in January, 2019. We are still seeing a strong paratranspo ridership recovery. Next slide. This slide shows paratranspo fare revenue that is tracking the same way as ridership. Paratranspo generated 165,000 in fair revenue in January, 2023. This is more than any other month in 2022. So with the end of the Paratranspo section, I'll now hand over to my colleague, David Barkley, Associate Director, Transit Service Delivery and Rail Operations to share with you conventional bus and old train performance indicators. Thank you, Scott. Uh, morning, Chair. Uh, as we look over the past 13 months, performance of the LRT line, there have been many months with strong reliability. Au uh, course de les 13 derniers mois de performance, il y a eu numéro de mots avec fort fiabilité. Generally speaking, this graph plots service reliability, and we want this graph to show basically a flat line, with our service target being 100% on rail. Councillors has previously requested um, that if there were any major issues, you asked us to report back. Since our last meeting, there have been no major issues. With that said, in February, service delivery was sitting at 97%. The impact uh, primarily came as the extreme cold in early February when we had frozen pipes and fire alarms as a result of those frozen pipes. So what we've seen over the last uh, two weeks is a trend back towards that 100%. Next slide, please. On the conventional bus side, 
Um, as Scott mentioned, we're sitting at uh, a very high, at, at high delivery of 97%. However, we know that there's much more work to do to achieve our 99.5% uh, rate that we're striving for. Continuing to hire uh, bus operators, active management of absenteeism, monitoring and adjusting service for traffic uh, on the roads to minimize delays are three of the things that we continue to do to try and improve service to get to that 99.5%. Of note, this past winter, what we've seen is the amount of snow that we've received, um, as well as the timing of winter events has had an impact on our customer service. Next slide, please. When we look at ridership on line one and conventional bus, uh, we have seen a constant trend throughout the year of improvement. While ridership remained below pre-pandemic levels, the red line shown on this graph, uh, the estimated budgeted ridership, the black line on this graph, we can see that month over month ridership was considerably greater when we compared to, to 2022, reaching 5.5 million customer trips in January compared to the 3 million in 2022. Our target for January, as mentioned, was 65%. And what we did achieve was 62%. And we are on target or heading towards our target of 70% over, the, over this year. Next slide, please. Similar trends when you look at our line uh, one and conventional bus revenues. Uh, we have seen that our, for the month of January, our revenues reached $11.3 million for 20, January 2023, which was above... Uh, above 2022 and uh, headed towards where our budgeted uh, uh, ridership is uh, intended. Thank you, Chair. We're open to questions. Okay, thank you, merci. Um, I wanted to make one other note and uh, before we keep going, uh, félicitations à René. Elle est uh, candidate à la présidence. Congratulations, René. She's a candidate for the chair. International Association of Public Transit. Um, I believe she's been on the board of that organization for over a decade. And uh, obviously this is a recognition of her leadership in, uh, in the industry. And uh, we wish you best of luck. You're making your pitch next week. So we wish you best of luck, Renee. Thank you. Thank Uh, we do have one delegation registered to speak today. We have John Reddins. Is John online, Eric? I thought he might actually be coming in this morning. So, Okay. Well, why don't we keep going with questions for staff? And if we're able to connect with John, we can bring him in. Um, so questions for staff on the presentation. I see Councillor Hill's hand up first. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the update and the presentation. Uh, congratulations uh, again. Um, I just want to confirm the the marketing strategy and the concept that uh, that kind of is generating the intent to start that process March through May for the paid advertisements. Because uh, my understanding in, in uh, engaging uh, over the last couple of months with you on the topic of kind of transitioning to hybrid, uh, targeting hybrid workers, uh, is that you're going to be looking at the, you know, the subscription model. And obviously I've got a, a notice of motion that I'm going to put in shortly that's going to talk about formalizing that process. But what is the value in starting that marketing process before we have that subscription model finalized, uh, and are we not not wasting? But are we are we uh, potentially setting the conditions where we're we're misinforming the public on the service that they could potentially be getting by starting that early? So I'll talk a little bit about the marketing campaign, and then I'll I'll pass it over to Pat Scrimger if he has anything to add about the the fair the fair review that's that's taking place right now for hybrid workers. Uh, so. We know that hybrid workers are back in the office now. It started in January and it has been a slow ramp up, um, but but the work has begun already uh, to have people return to the office. So we want to take advantage. We want to capitalize on this opportunity to start connecting with workers today as they as they return back. So it's really the focus right now uh, on the communications campaign is inform is is information and education about the services uh, for customers. Um, those who are coming back for the first time after a couple of years, having not taken transit at all or, or not very frequently, as well as new residents to Ottawa or, or new individuals who might have switched places of work or are coming back and are 
unfamiliar with the system. There's also been a number of improvements to transit, the pay pass system, for example, and transfers, et cetera. So we want to provide that information to them. So it's, it's, it's very education based at this point. Uh, the good news is most of it is virtual, right? Web, social, uh, digital ads, radio ads. So as we work, uh, as we work with the team to develop potential fair options, we will adjust the communications. Uh, it's a slow ramp up as well. You know, this is we're talking phase two at this point on on the advertising, uh, and then we will be revisiting again for summer and fall of next year, where we will ramp up again uh, based on what we learn for this time around. So lots of room to grow, lots of room to change. Thank you. Sure, I can say a little more. Uh, of course, yes, we are. As uh, Madame Amilcar said, we're working on um, options that we'll bring to you for consideration of a, a fair product that's partway between the single ride fare, the price of a single ride fare and the price of a monthly pass, uh, which might give people uh, a further option um, and further encouragement to choose transit for the trips. But uh, these customers are coming back now and they've been getting in touch with our customer service team asking a lot of questions because in many cases they haven't made this trip for uh, for three years and there have been some changes since then uh, or they just want to refamiliarize themselves with uh, the way the system works what current current arrangements are and uh, this this campaign obviously helps people to know some basic information uh, which can reduce the uh, reduce the pressure on our customer service team no, thank you very much. I know uh, talking to my residents, uh, the uh, the cost of parking downtown and the uh, the return of traffic on the highway, uh, those are starting to become real uh, impediments to, uh, to traveling by vehicle, which I think creates a real right market for you guys to get in there over the next year or so. So thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Reddins has joined us. So I'm going to go to John next uh, for his uh, delegation. Good morning, John. Um, if the speaker could please uh, accept the prompt to be promoted, or we can simply, oh, he's uh, coming online now, Chair. Okay, that took a while. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to talk about um, um, paratransport, basically, this morning. Um, the message from the last transit commission meeting from the management, don't worry, be, be happy. As a paratransport customer, I'll try to live independently. Most, and most of my colleagues want that. We are constantly growing, but you still put put curfews on a specific group of individuals that goes to what council did last term in expanding the city. It reminds me of the story of Cinderella. Is a paratransport bus going to turn into a pumpkin after midnight? Recent capital budget of purchasing more buses shows me you don't don't think we we need a life. That is. A, that is a mental toll. Today, I got question on my bookings for tomorrow. First of all, it's winter. And secondly, both my bookings are work related. I work for the Ottawa Senators Community Foundation 50-50 program to subsidize my ODSP for one booking. And the other booking was work related. My wife and myself run a lottery pool. The question is, why are you questioning my decisions of the use of paratransport? You are so worried about the, worried about the dollars aspect of the of that when you should be worrying about the human aspect. Don't worry, be happy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, John. Are there any questions for John? John, I I think you probably already have, but would encourage you to reach out to your city councilor about any specific issues. And obviously, they can connect you with uh, with OC Transpo staff. But I I know I know we've been in touch before as well. So uh, thank you, John. And I know you're back to speak to us on the next uh, paratranspo item coming up as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we'll go back to questions for staff, Councillor Brockington. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation this morning. Um, Mr. Scrimger, uh, when will the results of the telephone surveys that you're conducting be released to the to the commission in summary form? Uh, Mr. Chair, we will bring those back in our monthly uh, update um, as soon as as soon as they're tabulated. You had listed some of the questions or themes that you're pursuing through the survey. Are you asking former riders why they aren't taking transit anymore and non transit users, what would it would take to get them to start using transit? Yes, we are. Excellent. And what's your sample size? I believe it's 2000. Okay, thank you. Um, what are the criteria you're using for your route reviews? Well, what are you, what are you uh, looking for? Uh, Mr. Chair, we're starting with the established service standards that, uh, that council has approved and that we've been working with for many years. Um, we are uh, comparing that and developing a model of the complete network so that we can uh, test various options, looking at uh, travel time being the, the largest driver of, of um, um, the attractiveness of transit, uh, comparing travel time, total cost, and if we can, uh, if, uh, if we're able to at this turbulent economic time, predict ridership change from that, um, then we'll be comparing what we can do with some of these options we'll be testing. And if we need to change, or if we need to recommend to you any changes to the existing um, uh, existing service standards. So just so I'm clear, the objective of a route review is to what? It's, it's about increasing reliability or it's about consolidating routes to save money based on current demand? This is about neither of those. This is about making sure that we have a network that best meets the travel needs of the people of Ottawa. One big issue many of us raised during the budget discussion was the need to see increased reliability. Our general manager has made this a top priority for her. And uh, we heard that the investments made in the 2023 budget will yield positive results on improving reliability. How can we see at Transit Commission month after month a correlation between the investments that we've made in the budget and increased reliability? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, definitely with our KPIs that my colleague just showed you, uh, we saw that we're at 97% and the goal is 99.5. So my expectation is uh, we should continue to uh, to raise. Um, the only concern that we have actually, unfortunately, it's, uh, you know, that uh, it's very, very difficult for us to hire some bus drivers. So we're continuing our campaign that we launched last year. However, we, we know that it's very, very difficult. It's a, it, it's a challenge for us. It's not a, a showstopper, but it's a challenge that I would like you to consider. I think when we get the monthly KPIs, um, when we're talking about that reliability percentage, you can list right now some of the reasons that contribute to that number not being 99.5%. And... Um, I would want to give you the opportunity in future months to explain that the hiring of additional drivers or operators will help. If there are other factors, though, in future months that are pulling the reliability down that's completely not related to operators, you need to let us know. Because if there are other factors that are impacting reliability, I think that's important for us to, uh, to be made aware of. My last question is about the, I was thinking about this uh, traveling in today, about the animation of stations. And Mr. Scrimger talked about re the return of the busker program. Can you just expand on that about other retail opportunities, whether buskers will be anything other than musicians, because you, you spoke of musicians more than once, art, anything to humanize and put a um, I'm not sure the word I'm trying to look for, but like animate the stations to make it less institutional and more, hey, I actually want to stay here and enjoy a cup of coffee and listen to a musician or, or hang out with people. I know that was a focus before LRT opened. We acknowledge that we want to make these stations livable and enjoyable. So what is the plan 
uh, in addition to the buskers that are coming back. Uh, yeah, so Mr. Chair, we've, uh, as, as you know, if we go back to, uh, to where we were in 2018, 2019, um, we have uh, the, the design of the structure built uh, as, as it was built has room for uh, four retail outlets and we've successfully rented those. Two of those have opened. The, the, the company that rented the space from the city has had its own financial restrictions during the pandemic. Um, and uh, with ridership being lower, I'm sure they're not going to see the, the same volume that they had based their uh, their plans on. So we are still working with them to uh, open the other two locations so that there will be Happy Goat Coffee at, um, at Tiny's Pasture, at Rito, at Herdman, and at Blair. Right now it's only Rito and Blair that are open. Uh, the others, um, we hope, they will be in a position to open uh, fairly soon. As you know, we've also got the the lovely uh, um, art display at Rideau Station in that long corridor that's programmed by our our colleagues in the city. Uh, the busker program is open to uh, artists, performers of all sorts. Doesn't need to be uh, musicians, but that's the occasion for us relaunching the program right now. Um, we want to see more customers back in the stations as ridership grows, as more people return to travel all across the city. And we'll always be looking for ways to make the stations more lively, make them feel like they're part of the community, part of the city. Um, if that's um, more retail opportunities, okay. There, but there's not much room for more stores, but there, there might be room for um, small things mounted on the wall or, or put in the corner. But I don't know if, uh, if, Council's looking for uh, corridors that are full of vending machines either. So um, we'll we'll look at all the opportunities as they come up. People can certainly approach us with any ideas they have. And and part of the work that we're doing is sort of a spin-off of the work that you directed us to do um, last month as we look at providing the functional need of shelters at, at um uh, Herdman and Tiny stations catching up with where we were already at Blair station is we're also looking at what other changes can we make to these stations that go beyond the original design that we might want to reflect back to council for a potential um, decision in future years, even if it's just bringing more livelihood and more, more color to these, uh, these stations. And, you know, they'll look better in the summer, of course, than they do in the uh, monotone Ottawa winters. Councillor Menard. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks for the presentation today. I do, uh, on the, uh, just the PowerPoints that we send out, I'm wondering if we can just get those uh, in advance, a day or two in advance, because we get them when we're sitting here and got to look at the data and form questions on the fly, but it's always helpful for our teams, our staff, if we're able to have them a day or two in advance. I know the item comes to commission on the agenda, but is that possible? Can we get those PowerPoints a day or two in advance so that our teams can do some work uh, to make sure we've got good questions on these things? Chair, it's, it's, it's always possible, but uh, with the update, we're trying to do to be very, very last minute because we don't want to miss anything. So maybe we can share with you two days before, but it it could we we could have few or minor minors change this. Fair enough. And I think councillors probably accept that if there's a couple of changes last minute updating data, that that's fine. But I think just, just having it a day or two in advance would be really, just really helpful. Uh, but I do appreciate the, the presentation and uh, congratulations on the new communications campaign. I think that's excellent. And I did, I did go to the, and hybrid workers too. I know we're pushing on that and I know councillors Hill motion really support that and, and the work that you're doing on that. So uh, happy to see that as well. I went to the new blog and the new blog I think is, is great. It starts out, we did it. We've launched a blog. If it were 1999, this would be cutting edge. We recognize it's 2023 and a TikTok account would have been more timely. We're not ruling that out. We just need to work on our choreography. So anyway, well done on it. I just started looking through it and uh, it's it's nice to see that up there. So I hope people do go there. Um, uh, on the uh, on the PowerPoint, just a few questions. The On the safety issues, the one that stood out to me was actually the, the, um, the injuries to our employees, employee injuries. And so obviously we're, we're trending higher in 2023 
than the other statistics there. I'm just wondering, because those, those numbers are high, the 2022, 740, seems like a lot of injuries for, for our employees. So wh- wh- where are those happening? Is that, is that at 1500 Saint Laurent? Is that in the, like, wh- where are these injuries generally occurring? Chair, I would like uh, to invite uh, Paul Chibuta to answer that question, please. Yes, thank you uh, for the question, uh, Chair. Um, where we're seeing these injuries occurring uh, in kind of order of uh, frequency is the highest frequency is occurring uh, within motor vehicle type related incidents. Uh, and then after that, it's um, in the workshop themselves, in the garages, the, the, uh, the folks who work on, on the various uh, buses and equipment and so on. And as well, um, so those are the, what we call the struck or caught type of injuries. And then we also have uh, another category of injury called uh, overexertion, which uh, tends to be predominantly again in the, uh, in the shop area. And then the last uh, category of uh, employee injury is slips and trips. Um, so this is a result of our, our winter uh, conditions that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, it could be that uh, the employee is not wearing uh, correct footwear. It could be that, uh, you know, we've had a freezing rain event and we weren't able to get the uh, salt uh, down uh, fast enough to be able to, to prevent something like that from occurring. Okay, that's helpful. I mean, I was, I was supportive of the new... Um... I guess, uh, dividers, uh, for, for drivers, um, that came in previously. I, I just, I, I guess you're saying the number one area is collisions. Is, is that bus collisions or is that, is that in the yard? I'm just trying to key in because ideally we can reduce our injuries to employees. And if that's the number one area, then, um, is, is it actual collisions with the bus or is it, is it motor vehicle and not some other way. I'm just trying to key in on these. And maybe maybe you could send me the statistics just individually if, you, if you'd like, um, so I could just see where these are happening. Yeah, I'd be happy to follow up, uh, Chair, with uh, with a set of statistics after this meeting to uh, to inform you more on uh, the, the types of injuries that are occurring to our employees. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, on the, uh, the monthly statistics and the reliability, uh, appreciate getting getting those. Is there? Can we also include just given our campaign to to hire more drivers and to really reduce those cancellations? That's a big piece of our our campaign coming up, and the budget targets that. Can we get that cancellation data too uh, for those months? Do we have that available that we could easily plug into these presentations when we when we receive them? Uh, Mr. Chair, that's what um, slides seventeen and eighteen show. Okay, let so, me just go there because uh, I was looking. So that's the service delivery on the rail side, and then the bus service delivery. So that those are those are all to do with cancellation. So the, to the difference with. between ninety seven and hundred is the three percent of trips that we weren't able to deliver. Okay, can we just get those in? Oh, you've got them in nominal terms on the left here, I guess. Uh, no, that's percentage. So can you can you send it to us in terms of the, the figures uh, per month or per day so we can get a breakdown of the bus cancellations? I just want to see that trending down, right? And that's because that's our goal. So I want to see a trend line there of the cancellations as part of these presentations that can be publicly available so we can see the number of cancellations, not just a, a percentage, but a, a number uh, per day. Chair, if you don't mind, I think to do so, I will need to... Uh... Uh, briefly um, inform councillors how to uh, to interpret those numbers, because uh, sometimes we will take decision to limit it to limit the the consequence on certain area. So you will need to understand better that before I'm sharing that. For sure, I will be able to share it, and maybe for I don't know when we can do that. But uh, I will. I don't I don't want to just launch numbers without any uh, explanation because uh, we have to. No, fair enough. And I totally get that. I guess the, the concern is that we're saying one of the big things we're trying to tackle is, is cancellation. So even if it's an average per day in the month, that would be helpful to show that average going down, um, you know, as our hiring picks up, I think that would be really helpful uh, for the public to, to see and 
certainly that I get the most complaints about a bus just not showing up at all, whether it's a few minutes late or a few minutes early or on time. It's mostly the ones that we're getting complaints out of. Bus didn't come, stuck here again. The next trip's not coming for another half an hour, uh, 45 minutes. And uh, so just to see those statistics would be super helpful. Thanks for that. Um, on the increase in ridership, that's great news. Where, where are we seeing that? What, like, what are the trends in terms of the routes? Is this mostly from, say, U-Pass ridership? Is it within the core urban ridership? Where, where is this happening generally that we're seeing this increase in ridership? Uh, Mr. Chair, the, the increase that we saw, if you look back into mid-2022 on those, on those graphs, the increase that we saw in September, there was a very large uh, ridership increase in September 2022, mostly from people returning to uh, full-time attendance at high schools and full-time uh, learning on-site at the uh, colleges and universities. That was the September increase. What we're starting to see now uh, and hope to see more of as we see the February and March numbers is the people returning to downtown office work. Okay, that's really helpful. And I, I guess, will, will this inform the kind of network optimization you're doing, that, that type of work in terms of where we need to increase service? Say if we're seeing, yeah, UPass is picking up, we need more service at University of Ottawa, Carleton, you know, the number seven, whatever it might be, that I guess will inform that work. Uh, Mr. Chair, well, the ridership will certainly inform the, the service levels. We've been watching very carefully uh, as the customers have been coming back, whether there are any trips that are overloaded and need larger vehicles or an extra trip. And we've been doing that in some key routes. The biggest route where we've seen uh, that we've needed to increase capacity is Route 88 going across Baseline Road, serving both um, indirectly serving Carleton University and directly serving Algonquin College. And so there's more, there's uh, been some service increases on that route. We're watching all the others. We're certainly watching those uh, mainline routes, the ones that go to the, to the, uh, the larger destinations. Um, for the route design, we'll be primarily looking uh, not so much at the frequency of service or the capacity on the route, but where the routes connect. Uh, how did people's uh, travel needs persistently change with the, the, the changes in the pandemic. We know that uh, if some people are traveling only half as much to go to work at the office, they're still going to the same office, but maybe maybe half as often. But we've also heard that there are people who are going different places than they were uh, pre-pandemic. And that's what we'll try to, to collect uh, through the origin destination survey that's already taken place. And through the, the modeling work that we're doing is how can we how can we best reflect those, those needs? And of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, how can we uh, connect those trips, those bus routes most effectively to the, uh, it's not really three, it's really five O-Train extensions that we're opening over the next, um, over the next few years. That's appreciate that feedback and chair. Just the last point is just around the, um, that service review and that network. Um, I'd encourage public involvement. I don't know if there's a plan for public involvement here. I know certainly the new transit advisory group, but how how are you how are you doing public involvement? How are you going to take in the public's views in in making these sort of uh, views? Mr. Mr. Chair, we'll have more information for you that later. But but uh, we we will we are building uh, an outreach and consultation plan so that we can make sure we hear from uh, customers, future customers, uh, major employers advocacy groups, uh, stakeholder groups representing uh, uh, customers of, of certain interests, our own staff, bus drivers, train operators, um, and, and of course, uh, all of you as counselors. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we've got multiple uh, steps through that uh, review to hear what people have to say, to check in our ideas with them, and to uh, let those people react to the conclusions that we make. Thank you And we'll re be reporting to you on all of that work. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Councillor Lowe. Thank you, Chair. Um, I kind of want to build on um, what Councillor Menard was talking about in terms of the cancellation data that we're presenting. Because I'm I'm honestly uneasy about going back to our residents and telling them, hey, only 3% of your buses were canceled uh, over the last month, I think. Um, when, when on Route 74, for example, we only ran 87% of trips um, weekday evenings between January and February, between January 4th and February 10th, since the winter booking began. 
And, you know, to be fair, there were a lot of major snowfalls in that time, which all kind of started in the late evening. But if we're, you know, if we're telling people that, you know, 97% of trips ran, but then on, on the 74 weekday evenings, it was 87% on, you know, PM peak, it was 91%. Those numbers are obviously skewed by, you know, your 100% service deliver, uh, delivery rates in the in the early mornings and late nights when there are, you know, much fewer factors that affect bus service. Um, the second thing is within that 3%, there are obviously several different factors that cause a trip to be canceled, many within our control, many without, many outsider control. Outsider control would be something like I said at council on Wednesday, you know, our operator shortage within our control, maybe, uh, maybe factors like uh, human error um, and things like that. So um, is that something I can ask for, I guess, maybe, would you be willing as, uh, would you be willing to take maybe some direction to um, next, at uh, next transit commission within that cancellation data, kind of give us a breakdown of what caused, which, um, what caused the cancellation, um, what time period that cancellation was in, because a PMP cancellation may seem a little less significant than a midday cancellation. And then same, same as a uh, you know, canceling Route 6 is obviously going to have a much larger effect than canceling the 161. Chair, yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, second question was uh, about the buskers. Uh, do we, did, is, is that for every single station on line one or do we have select stations for that? Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't uh, remember that detail. I know that we've uh, looked at all the stations to find where there's an appropriate space for uh, the performers to uh, to work, and uh, we can uh, uh, we'll, we'll can follow up directly with the councillor on a, a list of which which stations that is across the full network. No, I think uh, it's a great program because growing up using the subway in Toronto, like going to an otherwise dreary and humid smelling Finch station, having that busker there actually makes it much more enjoyable. So I think this is a great program and something I would like, uh, um, to, something I would hope that we would communicate to the buskers is they, they're kind of, they kind of become sitting ducks in the stations and I do worry for their safety. Um, I do worry for their safety, especially at, at stations where there are more incidents. So that's, uh, that's something that I would hope to see communicated to them that they have resources that they can, um, you know, have have contact numbers in case something happens or they see something that makes them uneasy. Uh, my last question is about the, um, again, it's building on the injury rate from that uh, Councillor Menard was hinting at, sorry, that was uh, talking about. I know that uh, there were 69 injuries in January 2023 so far. Do these numbers fluctuate month to month? Because um, uh, one of them, I believe, was slips and falls. Do these numbers fluctuate month to month like with the seasons, because if if this rate keeps up, we're going to hit 828 injuries this year. That's more than 100. That's more than 100 more than last year. Yeah, Chair, um, thank you for the question. Um, yes, they do. They do fluctuate uh, from month to month. Uh, I think it would be um, presumptuous to assume a linear rate um, as as the year progresses. So some injuries become more prevalent depending on the time of year and so on. And uh, so um, January, it's a little bit early to say uh, with certainty whether we'll exceed um, the number of injuries that occurred last year and the year before. Um, that's all. And uh, are these is there like I know I know lately there's been like an increased awareness and communications to tell workers, hey, if you get injured at work, make sure you report it. Don't don't be a tough guy and tough it out. Make sure you report it. Does uh, does that have anything? Has that has any has that had any effect on the on the data that you've received? Um, thank you for the question, Chair. Um, I, I'm not aware of any sort of. Um situation like that. Um, we are a federally regulated workplace. We're subject to the Canada Labor Code requirements in, in respect of uh, the reporting of, of injuries. Um, every incident, every injury has to be reported and we have a standard uh, operating procedure for that that supervisors follow depending on the level of severity of that injury, workplace injury, and, uh, and then 
the supervisor uh, conducts an investigation, makes a determination as to whether or not there's actually a safety concern there that's involved, whether it's uh, related to the uh, environment, equipment, uh, not following procedures, so on. So, um, you know, every injury is, there's attention paid to it. And uh, at the same time too, I might add, as part of our safety management system, we encourage employees where they see potential safety uh, issues or concerns in the workplace to report those as well. And that's a very important element of our safety management system so that we can, we can get ahead of uh, injuries as opposed to being waiting for them to happen. Yeah, I, I remember those uh, banners really prominent at uh, the parking lot. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, if uh, One last thing I would add is uh, I, I kind of echo Councillor Menard's uh, request for some of that data that we're, you're, you present to us at Transit Commission before we get here. Um, even if it's not the entire PowerPoint, uh, like a bare bones board document, like of our ridership numbers of, of just percentages and, and paratransport wait times, for example, I think that would be uh, really appreciated. Thank you. Thanks. I know one of the challenges is because our Transit Commission meeting usually falls very early in the month, the, the later we can give staff to prepare that, the more time we have staff to prepare it, the more accurate and up-to-date the info. Um, but thank you. Uh, Pat, you had an update on buskers? Do uh, Councillor Lowe was asking which stations uh, and how many stations have uh, busker areas uh, designated. On O-Train Line 1, it's 12 out of the 13 stations. The only one that doesn't have the space is Searville Station. Thank you. Councillor Carr. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation this morning. I just have a, a couple quick questions. My first one, I'm, I'm very interested in the, um, the work that's being done to target federal public servants returning to work. Um, as a former federal public servant, I remember a time, I believe, where I used to be able to purchase, prior to pre Presto, I would be able to purchase my pass through payroll deduction or, or through the office. And I'm wondering if there's, I, I don't know if I remember that correctly, at, uh, but, uh, pardon me? The Echo Pass, yes, that's what it was. Thank you, Councillor Brockington. I wondered if there's any work being done with the federal public servants. To me, payroll deduction is really easy and it could um, increase uptake. And I wondered if we're looking at alternatives like Councillor Hill has wondered if that's something that's being considered. And secondly, I, I just wanted to uh, expand upon a point um, with Councillor Menard, uh, was speaking to you, Mr. Scrimger, about um, when you mentioned about the origins and destination study and, and routes have changed. I know for myself, I know many, many federal public servants. And uh, when that survey came out, many of them thought that they were going to still be remaining at home. Um, and in many, many cases, the office that they were in previously is not the office that they would will be going back to. And so I know you mentioned that uh, it would be looked at consultation with the federal public service as part of the service the service reviews, but I wondered if you could expand a little bit on how you will be engaging with federal public service departments and servants on those on those two issues together. Um, Mr. Chair, so first I'll, um, I'll comment briefly on the former uh, eco pass that was available up till about 10 years ago. Uh, it was the decision of council at that time to um, to withdraw the double discount that was available to the, the subscribers on on that uh, and uh, sort of put the um, ability to uh, make the decision of whether to uh, prepay, let, let people do it and manage it their own via credit cards with Presto Auto Renew that rather than doing it on uh, payroll deduction with the, 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 with the public service and the various payroll agencies. Uh, so that was a decision of council that we continue to follow. Uh, if council gives us different direction, uh, we could look into it. I don't know anything right now about the feasibility of uh, connecting with federal payroll systems. Um, on the uh, consultation with major employers, including the federal government, uh, will be as part of our consultation plan, we'll be uh, planning out the best way to do that. Um, uh, I, I don't know what how that will be yet. If, if Councillor Carr or anyone else has any suggestions on how we can engage with individual, um, you know, key contacts, 
at any major employers, uh, we'd be we happy to to take that information and use it in our work. Thank you very much. And I'm rather ashamed I called it an echo pass and not an eco pass, but thank you. Councillor Leeper. I loved that pass. The eco pass, it was amazing. Nice and easy. I wore it around my neck. But you're a nerd. <laughs> it, it, it's it's part of the stereotype of the civil servant back then. You got your 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 your, your fob and your eco pass. I love the eco pass. I apologize. Um, yeah, four. <laughs> All right, focus leaper. Yeah. Um, so uh, first off, I just want to say uh, thank you very much, uh, Pat. You got back to me uh, with respect to the question I had posed, I think at the budget meeting or possibly a transit meeting beforehand, in which I'd asked about the assumptions that you've made on the revenues that you would be bringing in and and the fair types uh, that are associated with that so if if you are assuming a certain number of people buying monthly passes you know that's one fair target or fair um, assumption uh, versus single fares you got back to me to say that what you're seeing is that there is a higher revenue i guess per trip post pandemic than there was pre pandemic because more people are purchasing single fares than monthly passes. And I'm just wondering, what is the trend in monthly passes? Um, are we seeing more of those being sold? And, and at what rate uh, is that accelerating if it is? Um, so Mr. Chair, that the one of the things we measure is the average fare paid by the average customer that we're carrying at that moment. So that's a composite of all the customers who are traveling, all the ways they're uh, either um, eligible to get a discount or that they've chosen to pay their fare. And that's been changing over time. We had a very, uh, you know, we had a very uniform trend pre-pandemic. Um, early during the pandemic, we saw the average fare per customer go down and we attributed that at the time to uh, our observation that it seemed to be customers who were eligible for discounted fares being the ones who continued to travel on transit while customers who were ineligible for discounted fares, primarily adult full fare, non-low income customers were primarily the ones working from home. Okay. Um, some of the lower income workers in the city never had the opportunity to work from home. You know, their, their work needed to be done on site. Um, some um, people who have uh, disabilities or are, have low income or are seniors or uh, other reasons for uh, being eligible for a discount, their travel needs didn't change. They continued to need to use transit because they had uh, fewer other alternatives than higher income people early in the pandemic. Later on, when we get to now, we are starting to see uh, more um, non-discounted customers coming back to the system. These are people we think who are traveling to office work downtown and to, um, who are coming back gradually. And because they are making as as uh, as we mentioned earlier, as um, Commissioner Hill mentioned earlier, because they now they need to choose between a monthly pass and a single ride fare, they are making that choice. Uh, they choose whatever is most convenient or most financially attractive for them. Uh, by policy decision of council, we price our monthly passes at thirty four times the price of a single ride fare. So someone who is making uh, 17 round trips a month will find it more economical to buy a monthly pass. And if you're making fewer than 17 round trips a month, you will find it more economical to uh, purchase single ride fares. When people are going to work half time, they might only be making uh, they might only be making 10 round trips a month instead of 20 previously. They might be making uh, you know, if they're working 
two days, three days, four days, it's going to make a difference. So the, um, the work that we're doing now is to see if we can uh, find a, a price and a mechanism to deliver that price for the people who are in between those extremes, where we can give them a price that encourages them to choose transit, but doesn't uh, result in, a, um, in an unsupportable uh, fair revenue loss from the budget set by council. Okay. Um, so to come back, I guess, to just my original question, though, uh, the number of monthly passes being sold, is that increasing? It is increasing, but it is not increasing at the same rate as at ridership. At the same is rate increasing? as total ridership. Okay. Uh, and we can, if, 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 if Councillor would like, we can dig into that further and look at some particulars you know, outside this forum. Thanks, and I, I don't think I need to make that as an inquiry then, but uh, I would be very interested in taking a look at those numbers. And we have a we have a strong interest, I think, as a city in trying to encourage people to use fair products that give them unlimited trips like the monthly pass, um, because not only then are you commuting, uh, but chances are good during the course of the day as the O train starts to extend further and further. Uh, and as people, you know, enjoy the experience of being able to use it to move around yeah. the downtown quickly, um, I, I would love to see people buying monthly passes so that they can take advantage of those non-commute trips. Um, Absolutely. Uh, there are other options out there for customers, which we're always happy. And part of the marketing campaign is to explain those options for customers. We've got the one-day pass. Uh, we've got the three-day pass. We got the five-day pass. We got the seven-day pass, all purchasable from uh, ticket machines and O-train stations. And the one-day pass also purchasable on a bus. Uh, we're getting closer. We're very, very close to... Uh, uh, allowing people to pay. They don't have to have a Presto card. They can pay with a credit card. Uh, later this year, uh, with a lot of uh, financial systems coming together, we're very optimistic. We'll also be able, able to accept debit cards. Um, and when people can start to pay by credit card, uh, later on by debit card, they will also we will also have for them an automatic cap uh, at the price of a day pass so that if they make two, three, four, five, seven trips a day, they will still pay no more than the single day um, cost of a day pass, all to encourage people to just, once you've paid your base amount, just keep keep uh, keep traveling by transit. Yeah, if you're at Ottawa U, uh, Queen Street Fair is really quick to get to if you're on the train and we need to find ways to encourage people to do that trip rather than say take an Uber uh, with the uh, That's right. house gas implications that we have. You've already paid for it. Uh, you know, the basics, I, I don't have the, I do have the budget right here, but I don't have that page memorized. The basics are that a, a, um, a one day pass has been for a long time set at about uh, three times a single ride fare. So once you've made three trips, every trip after in the same day is effectively free. What we've, before you've had to prepay and make that decision early to buy um, a day pass. What right. you'll be able to do now with your credit card is just keep tapping, just tap, 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 but you only get charged. It caps out at the, the price of a day pass. And so that's coming soon. That's not card. here yet. We've got technological steps, but that should be within the next countable number of weeks, we hope. Okay. I don't um, know how many hands it'll take, but countable, I'd, I'd say. It's coming soon. Count pretty high. Um. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for that. And I, I am interested in taking a look at the those monthly passes, how many are, uh, how the fare mix is changing at in a in a greater uh, greater level of depth. Um, with respect to cancellations, again, I, I think you know a number of us are uh, very focused on that because that is the um, probably the single barrier, single worst barrier right now to choosing transit is you don't know if the bus is going to show up, um, and that's that's not uh, that's not good. I'm pleased to see the um, increasing service delivery, um, such that we're up to 97% now. And obviously we want to see that get to Ms. Amilcar's target at 99.5. Um, how much of the improvement in cancellation is due to uh, better management of employee absenteeism versus more employees available to work as a result of hiring? Mr. Chair, <laughs> definitively we will need to to uh, brief uh, councillors 
how does it work because it's a little bit complex, but what we are seeing now, most of the cancellations are, um, it's because of the absenteeism, unfortunately. And the problem that we have also, it's although it's uh, when we have a bus driver, let's say the bus driver go, goes as relief instructor, we don't replace it. So we rely on overtime. So the the real the, the overtime that uh, we have available is too higher. So probably that's why people call sick on a normal day because they can they can do overtime the day after and they will get their paid anyway. So what I'm trying to do is to uh, have the maximum of uh, bus drivers in place to make sure that people will give their their hours uh, per week. And uh, the the second uh, the second reason that we 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 see a lot of cancellations is uh, for sure with the traffic, unfortunately. And when we have storm, when we have uh, a lot of snow, for sure our buses will uh, will uh, will be late. And sometimes it uh, we will take the decision to cancel a trip mm -hmm. to restart another one to make sure that we can be punctual. So that's why it's it's not very simple, and uh, I don't want to complicate it. Uh, at all, but there is a lot of decision that we can take with the TOCC, the um, who control everything on the world. So we'll come to you and explain how we take decisions, but it could change. One day we can we can do something, and the other day we can do something else. So it, it's it's um, we, <laughs> we need talentious people to manage that seriously because it's a little bit uh, challenging. However, as I said, we need more bus drivers. We need to uh, uh, decrease the absenteeism to be able after that to deal with the, the traffic and those kind of things that we cannot control. Okay, I think you've heard the appetite on the part of the commission to, to delve into those numbers and to be able to track them. Um, uh, we want to do our job of, of just making sure that OC Transpo is being held accountable. Um, and, you know, I think Councillor uh, Commissioner Lowe, uh, you know, raised some interesting points with respect to the uh, the different rates of cancellations among different routes. Uh, and I know a, a number of us would be interested in some kind of dashboard product uh, with respect to that so that we can uh, we can do our job um, of, of tracking that because it's it's quite concerning the level of cancellations we have right now. Um, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl, I'll leave it there. Okay. You. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Curry. Thank you. I'm glad I'm going next because so what Councillor Leeper is saying there, I agree we could get more data because getting it ahead of time, we, I'd, we'd be able to look at those graphs a little bit better and have more thoughtful questions. Um, and I agree that when you have an 87% route and then it's offset by a hundred, maybe we're not getting the actual picture, but at the end of the day, uh, what Pat, you said there last week or last month was that at the end of the day, we have to make some decisions and we can't forget that, that if we get that data and when we see, okay, well, this is a real problem that people are manipulating their hours and calling in sick so that they can do more overtime or whatever it is, then we have to be prepared to make some decisions like it's the issues that are such pressing ones that are the ones that come to us. The details and data, yeah, we get that, but then we have to actually do something. If we get that data and then we simply frown, you know, frowning is not that helpful. We can't just frown or just say, oh, wow, well, do a better job. We have to actually do something. So let's hope I'm not driving a bus. If that's what you're thinking we might be doing, I'm not driving a bus. I'm not fixing a bus. I'm not talking to anybody, but we have to actually do something once we get this data. So Anyways, thanks for all of that. Um, so on a more pleasant note, our newsletters, uh, I think are a great way to tell all of the things that uh, you just told us you're doing. So I just wonder, because uh, Councillor Gower and I asked, you know, will we get updates that we could put in our newsletters? I would love it if we got so much of what we heard here today. I think about how people might love to hear about the sharing path, like sharing the past. Like that's a key thing. I think that people will be like, oh, wow, I, I, we try to sneak and do that, but that we could actually do it would be a great thing. So if you could send us something that says for your newsletters and, and it would be appropriate for our newsletters, you know, not too much data, but explaining it, that would be great because we could do a lot, I think, in our newsletters to send out that information. I'm just going to say that. And then I was going to ask a question about the, uh, the pumpkin Cinderella uh, comment uh, from, uh, from Paratranspo. What, um, and 
I are, we looked it up, but paratranspo last call for our uh, booking is 2.30 in the morning. The last ride is 3 a.m. What is the, what's the time where you can no longer get a paratranspo vehicle? I'm thinking about John at the Sens Arena, right? The last call for 50-50 is sometime around 10.30. And then I, I'm not sure when he has to leave. I'm not positive and I don't want to give you wrong information. I think it's earlier than the times you've just quoted. Um, but the other thing that we uh, always do is we always meet any particular needs that an individual customer has. We encourage them to get in touch with us, talk to us. Um, we will only say no if there's a operational reason we have to say no. Um, uh, at the last meeting you heard from another customer who travels early in the morning before the regular service has begun, we've made arrangements with that customer um, uh, to have uh, staff come in to start earlier than they normally would and make sure that trip is delivered. Um, so we'll get you the, the exact times. They may even pop up in my text messaging any second now as I keep speaking, what the actual <laughs> times are for the last trip and for the... Um, for the last trip delivered, I uh, got one note here that the times you're quoting were were uh, extended hours for New Year's Eve. Normally, we're operating. Here we go, uh, uh, six in the morning till midnight for the the pickup time for for trips. But um, two of the things. One of the things I I mentioned earlier that we have the customer working group. We are working with that customer working group to try to map out what whether the and we'll bring you a recommendation if we reach a conclusion, which we haven't yet, is whether the demand for service outside those hours is high enough to warrant the additional cost of having staff available to deliver those trips, um, whether there's a need in, in some cases for those uh, occasional overnight trips to be made through paratranspo rather than through the uh, taxi chits that the that the, the city uh, provides, which are were are highly subsidized and delivered through our. So there's there's a lot of ways that people can travel. Paratransport is one of them, um, and uh, we will always work for cust with customers to meet their their travel needs, whether they're ongoing or uh, you know the other extreme, an emergency on that day. Okay, great. And I can tell you that already uh, people I've been talking to are so excited about the consultation on the route review. You know, I think you'll get a lot of interest in it from all, all types of people, you know, young, old, in every neighborhood. They just want to say what routes they now use and want, uh, which I think you generally know. I, I can tell you in Canada, people that used to be public servants and are retired. So they're not now hybrid, but they're retired. And they're saying, now I just want buses to get to the senior center, to get the library, to get internal uh, to Canada. So everyone is really uh, looking forward to that. So um, anything we can do to promote that uh, would be great. Anyway, thank you very much. Councillor Kavanaugh. Oh, pardon me, Justin. You're... I was just going to say, uh, Mr. Chair, that um, Councillor Curry, absolutely, we'd be happy to send a Councillor kit with um, communications products, a templated newsletter. We'll, we'll have that to you to everybody by mid next week. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Kavanaugh. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you very much to the, uh, the OC Transpo team. Félicitations, uh, Madame Amilcar, um, avec votre nomination. Thank you, wonderful, for your nomination at the presidency of the International Association. A few things, but I'll start with paratranspo ridership. Um, I keep thinking that it's going to grow, that um, we have an aging population. Uh, of course, I see it closely with uh, a large number of seniors here. And um, are we ready for it? Because there will be a growth. And um, uh, I, I'm concerned when, uh, when, when there's uh, issues. So, um, because, uh, it, it, and of course with driver shortages, that's, that's problematic too, but are we preparing for that? Can we see that demographic? Uh, Mr. Chair, on the, the long-term question, are we ready for it? Uh, we we expect it. We predict it every year. We we you know we forecast our ridership for the next year, and we recommend to council a budget that will meet that requirement. We have had more capacity than we needed over the last three years because ridership was down because of the pandemic. But if you look at the years before that, we were 
we were matching capacity to demand very, very closely. And it's been, you know, except on the odd occasion where something very strange has gone on, we're, we're running up into the five, six or seven years since we had to say no to a customer who wanted to make a trip. I remember, I think the last year before pandemic, we provided that chart of um, uh, demand met and it was, it was close. We couldn't show it. We couldn't say it was 100%, but it was closer to 100% than it was to 99.9%. Okay. Um, as, uh, as the, you know, the population ages, as new uh, people join the, the target market for paratranspo, um, we will bring our, uh, our conclusions, our recommendations to council in time that we've got time to buy if it's if it requires more buses if it requires hiring more um more people for the process with those will be in the the um, annual budget process i will also say however that one of the things that's going on at the same time as uh, the aging population is that more people are also more people with disabilities and different sorts of disabilities are taking advantage of the fact that the complete transit network is accessible and has been fully accessible for uh, going on 20 years now, that uh, people with different sorts of disabilities can find that they are able to use um, uh, buses and trains and stations without any barrier, except perhaps on days where there's a heavy snowfall or in days when you know their, the nature of their disability is affecting them more, more heavily than, than on other days. And that is, uh, you know, sort of countervailing the the general um, percentages on the aging population. So we're we're watching this continuously, and um, if we ever run short, we will we will come and tell you what we need. Thank you, and I don't mean to imply that seniors all need paratransport because they don't. Um, they, I'm one, uh, but uh, so. Uh, no, I, I think that it's just something that we're just seeing in our office, just more more calls than we had before. Um, so just checking in. The TAP technology is, is fascinating. I think it's actually a really good thing for increasing ridership. Um, frankly, I, I don't think people will be concerned about the cost if they can just tap and go because it's the convenience. Is that, are, are you saying, I just want to make sure I understand, is that coming to all buses? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. This is the credit card payment and the 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 monthly the the daily cap. Uh, monthly cap might come a little later, but yes, by all buses, all train stations. By what date? I uh, don't know yet, but uh, soon, very soon, but not you know not tomorrow and and not as far away as the fall. It'll be soon, but I don't I can't define that yet. There's it's just, it's, it's uh, you know, there's the physical work of putting the new readers in the buses, which as you've seen is almost complete. Almost all the buses have the the new red uh, smart card readers. The big thing is the um, the financial security required behind the scenes to allow credit card information to be transmitted through our network. It's called PCI compliance and uh, there's no shortcuts. It has to be right. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I like the motion from uh, from Councillor Hill, uh, and uh, I mean, when you go traveling, um, it's you're often able to, you know, because you're only in a place for you know a certain amount of time, you can get like a pass that's for x number of days, or but also x number of trips, which I think is what people are getting at. Um, so that maybe that can be fit in with the tap culture, like twenty trips, ten trips, so that you're paying for that rather than. Um, uh, for the the entire monthly pass, is that what we're getting at, uh, Mr. Chair? That's one of several options we're looking at. Yeah, um, I think I think it's great for the tourism um, because uh, people will know that they can uh, use it for x amount of time or x number of trips. So I, I think that will be a real boost to tourism, um, and that's coming back. You know, it's all these things that we lost during the pandemic. Um, the children's pass, and congrats to. Uh, Councillor Brockington for his motion um, at budget committee um, and um, having children um, after July 1st uh, ride free under 12. Um, how do we collect the data on that? And because I want to know how successful it is and 
I, I suspect it will be very successful and it'll be more adults coming along, you know, taking a bunch of kids out. So um, um, it, that, that's always kind of puzzled me how you keep track of it when they're free and you're, you don't have the data collection. How does that work? Uh, Mr. Chair, we will not have the same certainty of the number of people. Uh, we will be able to uh, count the number of number of legs that have walked through Fairgates where we've got uh, infrared readers. We'll be able to count the people when, when a, you know, a, a youth or adult uh, fair is paid, how many people walk through. We'll be able to see if there's any extras. Uh, uh, we'll also, you know, do a little bit of, we can, we can do a little bit of work when we've got the passenger count, automatic passenger counters on buses and compare that to, um, uh, to the number of people who've paid a fare on a bus, but we will not have one-to-one -one countable data unless we send people out to count the data. So if it's really, really important to know, we will, you know, hire and assign staff to, to watch people. It's not something that's machine doable. Okay. Oh, thank you. I think the tap technology is really important. Um, I already asked you at budget about the GPS, so I'm going to leave you alone on that. Um, and and uh, I'll wait till you you come back with that uh, information because I, I, I expect you will um, in terms of, uh, of uh, apps and uh, technology for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lowe on our second round. Yeah, I'm back, sorry. Um, uh, this question about, uh, this is further to the conversation that uh, that was going on about extending the paratranspo hours. Would that be a, if, if we can somehow do that without any additional cost, would that be a council decision? Like are the hours dictated by policy on our side or, or is that just a decision by you based on the budget we allocate? Mr. Chair, we need the money to be able to do so. And we know that we struggle this year. So uh, anything that uh, uh, we had, we will need to subtract something else. Understood. Um, and okay, I just want to finish off by echoing uh, Councillor Curry's uh, comments that I, I think a communications package for, for our monthly newsletters would, sorry, our, our periodic newsletters would be very nice. Um, we do this for the Ottawa Public Library, and I think there's it, it kind of uh, benefits the uptake in their programs and everything. So if uh, maybe make this a regular thing, too, that I think would be very helpful. All right. Thank you. Council Brockington. Thanks, Chair. Just one passing comment um, about the marketing or, or uh, communications. The um, CEO of Ingenium and I have sat down with the executive director of the Food and Agriculture Museum. The Ingenium looks after three museums in the city, talking about uh, bus service to the museums. The farm in River Ward has a seasonal route. I think it's the 185 that runs in the summer months. All is to say, promoting these routes not only to Ottawa residents, but tourists as well who visit these sites. Lots of volunteers volunteer at the farm. And I think there's a general lack of um, unawareness or lack of awareness about these routes, particularly the seasonal route, which isn't sort of in everyone's um, transit psyche. So I just wanted to plant that there, there, there are opportunities to get more riders to these destinations, particularly in the summer months when we have a seasonal route. And I just wanted to uh, make you aware of that as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, pre previously, before pre-pandemic, we um, and in my own former life when I was in corporate communications, we worked with Tourism Ottawa, uh, Ottawa Tourism, Ottawa Tourism, sorry, um, to uh, promote, for, uh, you know, S S Ottawa City of Ottawa services uh, for uh, for tourists coming to the city who want to know, you know, how to get around or what to do. Um, but we will use as, as part of that partnership for that, that, that phase two capitalizing on these events and, and activities, we will certainly reach out to them and, and offer them as well um, language and, and information to, to, prom to promote tr a transit service. Yeah, I think there's ample opportunities for every destination in the city. We're not there yet, but every description in any type of brochure, uh, any type of advertisement, there should be a route 
a bus route or an LRT station mentioned. So if you're going to take public transit for every single destination in the city, here is the route or the line that you take, but thank you. Okay, I had a couple things I wanted to ask about. One was um, in the ridership actuals versus budget. So the actual number of riders in January was 5.5 .5 million against our, our budget of 5.8 million riders, which is 94.8%. But then the actual revenue was $11.3 million versus $12.9 million budgeted, which is 87.6%. So we, we achieved almost 95% of our expected ridership, but our revenue was at 87.6% of what we budgeted. Why the discrepancy in those two numbers? What are we seeing there? Uh, Mr. Chair, that that's about some of the same um, effects that I've was talking about earlier in uh, response to Councillor Leeper's questions that uh, things are changing so fast during the pandemic and on the different stages of recovery from the pandemic, uh, which people are traveling during that month, um, whether those people are traveling on a discounted fare or a full fare, whether they're choosing monthly pass or choosing a single ride fare is making a big difference. January is... Uh, you know, in January this year was probably about the first 10 days was still influenced by the holidays. Uh, so, and the, the, you know, the federal return. So a lot, a lot of uh, office workers and a lot of university students were not traveling during the first third of the month. Um, when we get into February, we'll have the shorter month, but you know, di different, different snow effects. We, we really got to look at it over a longer period to draw any trends on, um, who's paying what fare and uh, what are they, who's traveling and what fare are they choosing in their own best circumstance to pay? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's just, it'll be interesting as we talk about different fare discounts or packages. And we, we do have to be cognizant of the budget that we set and making sure that we're, we're not discounting too much that we're going to be at risk of not being able to meet, uh, meet the budget. Um, the last thing is just, yeah. I'm really interested to see the results of those survey and, and interested to see how some of the public feedback is is uh, being considered and applied to advertising. Um, the top three questions we've been getting from riders going back to work in my ward. One is, uh, they're all pretty easy ones to answer, but it's interesting because they're ones that I would take for granted because I've been taking the bus and the train throughout. One is, can I get a spot at the park and ride still? How hard will it, if I show up at 8.30, will I be able to get a spot? Um, yes, absolutely. It's easy to get a spot. Um, the other one is how long will I have to wait for the train in the morning, which, you know, well, probably about five minutes. Um, and then the other one is what app can I use for uh, to find out when my ride comes? So to regular users or maybe even to staff, these would seem like really obvious questions. But for if you haven't taken a bus or the train in three years, you do have some some uh, really good questions that uh, we need to answer. So. Uh, thank you for the presentation today. I don't think there's any more questions. Um, we're going to move on now to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, Councillor Lowe's motion. He gave us notice of this motion. It's on paratranspo, the fare zone study for Barhaven, Riverside, South, and Manitick. We have one speaker registered, Mr. Reddins. But uh, what I'd like to do is, Councillor Lowe, if you could just quickly introduce, you know, don't need to read the motion again, because you did that last time. But if you could quickly introduce for us uh, what you're trying to accomplish, uh, what the motion would do here, and then we'll go to Mr. Reddins for his comments. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Um, this kind of builds off a fun joke that uh, that's partially becoming reality, that Barhaven is about to swallow Manatic. So with, with the growth of both communities, uh, not only are they becoming geographically closer, but socially closer as well. That means it's quite normal for residents in one to seek uh, employment and services in the other. Uh, one such example is the Share Community Group Home in Manatic uh, Village, which uh, provides young adults with special needs um, with opportunities to become more independent. And their clientele includes many people from across Barhaven and bits of Riverside South. Um, currently, once a paratransport vehicle crosses Barnsdale Road, uh, the trip becomes a $10 rural flat fare. Um, and I'd like to note that the southernmost extent of Barhaven abuts Barnsdale Road and the northernmost bit of Manatick abuts Barnsdale Road. So this motion kind of asks uh, staff, well, this motion asks staff to explore the feasibility of creating 
uh, a special kind of paratransport fair zone in recognition of that geographic and social closeness uh, of the community's need for an equitable option for uh, paratransport users to get between Barhaven and uh, Manatic Village, which is, uh, you know, if, if the question comes up about why not Orleans and Cumberland or why not Canada and CARP, it's because there really is just about a kilometer or two between these two communities. Okay, thank you. So we'll come back to questions for staff afterwards, but we'll go to uh, John Reddens. John is registered as a delegation. Hello again, John. Yeah, uh, like a, um, I like the intention of the of the motion, but it puts puts one area versus another area. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, I live in Hearing Gate areas. The casino in Gatineau, fourteen one kilometers regular fare. Casino on Albion Road, 11.2 kilometers from my place, $12 one way. Manatic Library, 19.3 kilometers, $12 one way. My doctor's in Stittsville, 34.7 kilometers, regular fare. People on people the paratransport have doctor's appointments on, on Greeley, in Greeley, $12, $12 one way. Some areas in Stittsville is not free. Cart, we have customers that use paratransport. They have to pay a fee. People with disabilities just can't hop in a, in a car to go to these spots. You offer a cab coupon, but bylaw services are still working on a report, report for the accessibility cab. The lack of, lack of transportation for people with disabilities to important, like doctor's appointments, can make, make or break someone on affordability. We, we have to look at the whole city. I'm asking, I'm asking someone else move a friendly motion to study the whole, the whole city aspect for paratransport. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Are there any questions for John? Councillor Hill, I see your hand up. If it's for staff. Uh, okay, any questions for John? I'm seeing none. Thanks for sharing your perspective, John. We are going now to questions for staff. So Councillor Hill. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Gower. Um, how long do you think the feasibility study would take to uh, to un to undergo this, uh, Mr. Chair? I'd say there's two parts to this. the The data collection part is fairly simple and will take, uh, you know, just a few staff days to do. The first part of the motion where it says that staff study the feasibility of creating will really require um, ongoing repeated discussion with uh, council, the the councillors who are on that on, on that rural urban fringe inside and outside that boundary um, and then some wider discussions probably in, in small groups with all councillors the the current funding model for urban versus rural transportation service whether paratranspo uh, or conventional has uh, on the two two times that council has made a policy change since amalgamation, it's been a it's been the work of months to find that balance that staff could recommend to the that would be acceptable to council. Um, so what we're saying in in our response to this is we think we could um, get you some conclusions so that you and council could make a policy decision in time for the. Uh, the tax changes to be uh, considered as part of the 2024 budget. Uh, thank you very much. I, I suppose I would ask uh, the mover if you'd be willing to uh, make a friendly mo uh, amendment to the motion to include that that time frame specifically in uh, in the context of the motion. I'd, yeah, I'd say so. Like Q three before we start budget discussions? Would that be feasible? Uh, to Mr. Chair, that's consistent with the staff comments that we've provided in the uh, under the motion. I'm good with that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Leeper. Thanks. Um, so this is a worthwhile inquiry, but I'm just wondering, uh, maybe for uh, Councillor Lowe, is there a reason it's not a an inquiry from which you take the results and make a proposal for a council or, or a commission's decision? 
I just I I worry that we send these things to staff, trying to get staff to come up with a conclusion that we want, uh, rather than doing our homework, coming up with a proposal that uh, for the consideration of the commission, uh, and then asking us to vote on it. That's for me, right? Yeah. Um, excellent question. Excellent point. Um, I'll be honest, it was, I created this during budget time. So I, I thought of this as a motion and staff had said, you know, I think it's better that we study it. So I kind of, I was a little narrow-minded in making this as a motion because it started as that thought for me. So um, that's, that's the honest answer. Okay. I just, um, I, I'll vote in favor of this, I'm sure, uh, but I, I, I'll be curious to see what the, the factual basis for their findings are, because I think that's what you need to work with in order to actually make a proposal, rather than ask staff to uh, sort of try to nudge us in one direction or another. Uh, I know how busy uh, OC Transport staff are, so thank you. Councillor Brockington. Thanks, Jay. I guess the the challenges I'm having with the motion for us is it's specific to a uh, geographic area of the city as opposed to the city as a whole. And I think Mr. Redden's comments illustrate the discomfort I have at the moment is we have these examples, not just in uh, wards three and 22. And so even if this passes and staff do the work and we make changes, we're going to smooth out the fares being charged in this geographic area, but then leave all the other areas where we should address it unaddressed. So my, I'm just trying to think, think through this. I think getting the data is important and it can better inform us on how we want to potentially apply this citywide. And I'm, I would hesitate to do work on any particular wards in absence of a citywide focus. I wonder if staff share that concern or not. Does staff not believe that this is, you know, a, a pretty precisely focused motion as opposed to the advantages or benefits of a citywide focus? Uh, Mr. Chair, we we will always make our recommendation pointing, uh, you know, in, in every recommendation, everything will be influenced by uh, the equity and inclusion lens where we make sure that we're treating all the customers of the city uh, appropriately. And if there's ever a discrepancy there, uh, we would bring that to your attention. But we're also, of course, you know, as we will always follow the direction of council, this would, if it were adopted, uh, create some different policies that were in place in Manitic than in Greeley, in Barhaven than in Canada. Uh, and that could result in different levels of service in those areas than in the rest of the city. That could result in different tax rates in those areas than in the rest of the city. Um, we would have to comment on that and provide that information to to you and to to council to say this is this is what what you would be asking us to do if we did this. Um, we would always prefer to be constructing uh, policies that we'd recommend to you from a citywide perspective. Um, and but but the the nature of all of this work along the the rural urban boundary is that it's very local. The demands that the councillor speaking of are local. Um, the but they're not exclude. They're not. They're 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 not. They're not in a, a small box. There are people who are traveling between Barhaven and Manitic, Manitic and and Barhaven for their uh, routine needs. But they're not distinct from the people who are traveling from just that little bit further. Uh, into Nepean or just that little bit further into uh, Rideau Township. There's um, there's a real need here and the, the policy decision that council made in, I'm guessing that it was around 2011, end of 2011 to uh, replace the previous fare by distance, the three zones for rural fares, which gave the 
uh, and we had a, a, a quite a number of, of separate fare types at that time. And the decision that council made at that time following um, strong delegations from the public was single flat fare for all trips across the rural urban boundary. Flat fare, not, we had had $9 trips. We had had $5 trips going up to $25 trips. They said, you know, the, the decision at that time was flat fare for all of these trips, made it a lot easier for us to administer, a lot easier for uh, customers to understand, but financially was uh, to the advantage of people who traveled further and against the interests of people who were making shorter trips. Um, we had a very, very complex fare zone system during those years of sort of 2007 to 2011, which the decision of council to simplify really made it easier to explain to people. This would be one step back into a more complex system. So I, I just, I'm not disputing the the um, matter that Councillor Lowe has raised in, in his ward and between the two wards, but um, in absence of sort of a city-wide focus where this could be named as one of the geographic areas to study, I, I can't support the motion as worded now because I do believe it will just create greater inequities between certain communities. I'd prefer we look at it as a whole to try and smooth that out. So um, I just wanted to share some of the concerns I have at this time. Thank you. Councillor Menard. Oh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I know Councillor Lowe is up as well and may have may, maybe make a change or something. I'm not sure, but uh I just wanted to just briefly comment on um, the urban transit area and rural area A and rural area B. Um, I don't think this has a big effect on those things, but do you anticipate changes to that, those policy pieces based on service this, this term? Well, Mr. Chair, we'll have a, we'll have a report to you this year uh, to um, follow the policy direction of council that the urban transit area will always be the same as the urban area. In the official plan, there'll be a bylaw necessary to update the boundaries of the urban transit area to match the urban area as it is now defined in the, the new official plan as it was approved by the province. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of new little uh, pieces of land which were brought into the urban area will bring them into the urban transit area that will reduce their paratranspo fares that will make them eligible for uh, inclusion in our uh, analysis of, of future route changes. We are not currently, other than that, thinking that we'll recommend any change to the basic structure of how transit is funded. Okay, very helpful. Thank you for that uh, that open answer. And I guess just to my colleague, uh, Councillor Lowe, might might be best to push this into a an inquiry to staff to come back to us, um, just based on the conversation today. Councillor Lowe, is this procedural? Yep, go for it. Yes. Um, no, I, I think uh, given given some of the conversations that we've had around the table here, and given my own acknowledgement that I was a little narrow minded when I was creating this. Um, and some of the concerns that Councillor Brockington had shared because I shared similar concerns with some of his motions. Uh, <laughs> um, I no, no, what? No, I think no. I honestly think that he he raises a very good point, and and I am willing to withdraw this motion and change it into an inquiry that covers the uh, rest of the city as well. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lowe. So Councillor Lowe is withdrawing the motion. Councillor Curry, did you still want to? Speak on it. Okay. Then we move on. Thank you to staff for answering our questions on that. Uh, we have a notice of motion for a uh, for the next meeting, Councillor Hill. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, my motion uh, it speaks to essentially. A lot of the work that's ongoing right now it formalizes that and uh, and adds uh, some some uh, oversight components so whereas the statistics canada december 2022 labor force survey found that approximately one out of every 10 workers now works both at home and and an, at an employer provided workspace commonly referred to as hybrid working whereas over a hundred thousand federal public servants uh uh employees who uh 
in Ottawa have been instructed by the federal government to return to work on a hybrid basis uh, based on two to three days per week, whereas other private sector employees have also begun to require employees to work from the office using a hybrid working model. Whereas Priority 7 of the Climate Change Master Plan calls on the City of Ottawa to incentivize private action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, including increasing usage of uh, public transit. Whereas a worker using a transit to commute uh, to work full time would make on average about 44 trips per month and an employee only commuting for two days a week may make 10 or less trips over the same period. Whereas a worker using a monthly pass to commute to work full time would save an average of $37.30 when commuting to work 22 days a month. Uh, and that same worker would now stand to lose $51.50 if a monthly pass and commuting to work 10 days uh, per month. Uh, whereas the current OC Transpo monthly pass is design designed to provide subscribers with value after their 34th trip or after their 17th day and is no longer financially valuable to hybrid workers working in an office two or less days per week, whereas the approximate average cost of parking in downtown Ottawa is about $20 per day, and competing with the cost of parking has not proven to be a sufficient financial incentive to attract hybrid workers back to the public transit, whereas the New York uh, Metro Transit Authority, the largest transit provider in North America, has introduced an innovative 20-trip ticket for its Metro North Railroad to provide a 20% discount to incentivize hybrid workers taking the authority's Metro North Railroad, Whereas commuters have spent three years reconditioned to using their cars and innovative incentives are required to change their behavior and entice hybrid workers back to public transit. Whereas a current barrier to public transit is the lack of incentive for many hybrid workers to get a transit pass because there's no subscription model that meets their needs. Therefore, be it resolved that the Transit Commission direct staff to develop and report back to Transit Commission and Council on a new monthly renewable fare model targeted at hybrid workers be it further resolved that the new subscription model be designed to provide hybrid workers with similar incentives as they received when using the monthly pass to commute to work five days a week. Be it further resolved that an appropriate marketing plan that addresses the cost of private vehicle parking, the significant increase in highway traffic year over year, and the benefits of the new hybrid pass be developed for launch in concert with the new subscription model, and be it further resolved that staff provide the Transit Commission a report by Q3 of 2023 outlining their progress on the development of the new subscription model or models with a goal of implementation no later than Q4 2023, sir. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hill. So we'll consider that at our April meeting. Are there any other notices of motion today? Okay, uh, any inquiries? Okay. Uh, any other business? I don't think so. Uh, then uh, thank you, everyone. We are adjourned, and our next meeting is April 13th. Have a great day.